Hello everyone, nice to have you here. Today I have a video that I'm pretty excited about because in this uh, video I'm gonna show how I converted my Unreal project to Unity. And uh, this was something that seemed pretty crazy when I thought about it the first time. Uh, but now I'm very glad that I did. The main reason that I did this was uh, because recently I've had the chance or let's say the opportunity to work on this project full time because like many of you in the industry I got uh, laid off and uh, there was actually a blessing in disguise because now I can afford to take some time off and really work on this project and try to make something out of it. I still don't know exactly what I'm gonna build. I have uh, a few different ideas that I'm each day um, I'm condensing them, distilling, you know, like synthesizing. But I put myself a target and my target will be to release just the VR environment by the end of this year. So I have six days left for this and uh, I'm in a pretty good stage for that. And then I'm going to take another three months and try to make something out of this. So I want to expand this environment, add new rooms, uh, add some items to explore, like some, some stuff to read. I want to make it a more interesting experience. So yeah, I'll be sharing my journey along the way. And the main reason that I converted this project to Unity, which by the way was a ton of work, <laughs> It was not easy, uh, is because I feel uh, more comfortable developing uh, gameplay and systems uh, with C-sharp and Unity. With Unreal, I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I have a really hard time uh, visualizing how the systems work with the different blueprints and then it feels like everything I want to do, uh, I get lost in these windows, I'm opening different windows and tabs and these files like start to reference each other, it gets really hard to develop as a solo developer, in my opinion, because Unreal was developed as a AAA engine, right? So let's not forget this. It started uh, at a AAA studio by AAA developers to make AAA games. It's amazing when you have a big team and uh, a lot of experienced devs, you know, they know what they're doing. Like, I don't know exactly what, uh, what I'm doing, like when it comes to programming, I'm still learning. So Unreal turned out to be like way too complex for what I want to do. I was always having ideas of like what I wanted to do and like how I wanted to develop this project. But then I would find myself thinking that like, oh, but that's going to be too hard to do in Unreal or like I, I don't even know how to start on this. And meanwhile, when I would have these ideas, at least I could visualize how to build them in my mind with Unity. And of course, like once I start building, I learned that it's not necessarily what I thought it would be, right? Like there's always learning. I just feel um, more comfortable developing gameplay systems, you know, like save system, loading levels, like all this kind of stuff is much easier in Unity for me. So I hope that with this conversion, I can develop this project much further uh, as a solo developer than I would be, than it would be possible in Unreal. And as you can see, the, the, the map looks very similar to Unreal. Like both engines have the pretty much the same workflow when it comes to lighting and texturing. Um, but I actually think it looks better now because uh, I've been doing some asset cleanup and uh, I fixed the texture albedos, you know, so they're more PBR correct, let's say. So I think overall the map looks better. Uh, there is another thing that I really like in Unity is the render quality. Like if you zoom in, uh, you, you see like the thi things just look sharp. And uh, I feel like a lot of times in the real, my work was getting muddy. You know, like if I zoom in on the uh, screen, uh, things just look a little blurry, like a little flickering. There's still some flickering here. I'm not sure if it's gonna show up, but it's from the anti-aliasing. Anti it's not about like, oh, this engine is better than other. I think they're both amazing, you know, like for different purposes, like for uh, if I was going to make a shooter game or like an Uncharted kind of game or like a Tomb Raider kind of game, I would totally go with Unreal because it has better systems for uh, like moving the character, like doing this kind of stuff in Unreal. If I was going to build like an RPG or, you know, like something with more uh, custom gameplay, uh, I think Unity is easier. Also for VR, I think Unity is much easier to develop for. Uh, things are a bit more clear, they're more developed. 
For example, I can have a VR and a game, and a normal game mode with just a few toggles. So I'm going to set this up. So when you open the game the first time, you can choose if you want to play in VR mode or desktop mode. And I'm going to try to develop the game for both at the same time. And my mindset for the VR version is I'm actually going back to the roots of when I first got my uh, Oculus DK2. That was the first uh, VR headset that I had. And uh, that was before there was a tra uh, motion tracking, the controllers with a uh, motion tracking. So most of the experiences there, they were just a camera uh, moving in the world. And for me, those were much more immersive than the ones now with the motion controllers, because I feel like with the motion controllers, you start to have expectations, you know, that you can affect the world uh, more than you can. So if your hand goes through a prop or, or something, it just breaks the immersion. So I actually went back to the roots. I disabled the motion controllers and um, and I enabled the gamepad. So I was play testing this with the headset and the gamepad. And I, I personally like this much better. I feel like um, the map was more immersive. You know, it's easier to accept that you're just a camera in a virtual world. And I was actually, and I was also playing a uh, sitting down with just the gamepad. I really feel like that reduces the motion sickness chance. Anyways, let's see if this is gonna, you know, connect to people. So I want to release this version soon with just the gamepad. And uh, I want to see what's the reaction there, if people like this. Uh, I, I have a feeling that it's going to be uh, much easier for people to jump in. Because back in 2016, I went to Brazil and I presented the Sampa VR uh, scene at an Adidas event. And back then, it was only gamepad too. And I had all kinds of people come and try the scene. Like people from my family, you know, like elderly people and everyone got the hang of it right away with the controller. Like no one had motion sickness. Uh, they understood that they were in a uh, space. So um, I want to get back to that. And the other uh, big thing that made me switch to Unity is the lighting uh, system that they developed now called uh, Adaptive Probe Volume. And uh, let me just show real quick what it does. So we go to analysis, render, debugger. So one of the hardest things uh, to get good in a game in terms of technology is the global illumination, which is the effect you get when the light bounces, right? Like, so the sunlight hit here and then it's reflecting here. If you're a total beginner, you, 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 maybe you didn't notice this, but you know like this is only lit here because the light is bouncing from the surface right and uh, the way that we used to get this in the past was with light maps and light maps are very annoying workflow because uh, that's what i use on the spanish style in the tutorial Envi environment art mastery you have to create this uh, uh, light map uvs you have to bake and the baking takes a long time uh, and the other solution is ray tracing lumen the real-time gi solutions and those are amazing for work on portfolio pieces. You know, if you're just going to post an art station or you're going to release a small demo, it's perfect for that. But it's very performance intensive, right? Like it's not going to run in VR for quite a few years. So the answer to Unity for this is the adaptive probe volumes. And what they do is basically you generate uh, these uh, probes. So you see like each dot here the the baker calculated what's the lighting situation in that point in space and then the surface just samples the nearest uh probe so this is pretty smart because the the light probe technology before used to be like an object could only have one probe so we we, we would use this for a prop lighting for example on uh, overwatch or you know like or other games that have baked lighting, but then you need dynamic lighting for props, for characters. So, but the prop or the character would take just one probe, you know? So if you move from one probe to another, the light would uh, jump from one, one to another. But now with this tech, it, it just samples uh, per pixel. And uh, the this brings a lot of benefits. For example, smooth gradients. Like look how smooth the gradients are here. Uh, the corners look perfect because with light maps, I would get a seam there, you know, like there would be a hard edge here. 
and it would kill this effect that I'm having here with the normal map decal that creates this uh, sculpted edge and uh, it bakes very fast like this whole map takes uh, one minute to bake like all these probes bakes in one minute it runs on mobile like runs on you know like very weak hardware so there's a lot of benefits and uh, you can move objects you know and they react right away to the bounce so uh yeah a lot of benefits i really like this workflow it was very easy to set up and uh, if you want to learn more about it uh, check out the unity channel adaptive light probes because this is their new big technology you know like to compete with a with a epic and, and unreal so anyways, um, before I move on, I just want to show how the assets actually turn out. So to do this conversion, I, I had to recreate some stuff in Unity, right? It was not like, a, oh, you click one button, everything gets transferred. I uh, used a script for that. But the conversion of the assets from that script, it was not ideal. So for example, each uh, material instance in Unreal was becoming a different a standalone shader in Unity. And that's pretty bad for performance. I wanted all of them to share the same materials as much as possible, the same shaders. So I had to recreate those shaders. And uh, so there is this one that I created, the architecture shader that covers um, like 90% or more of the objects in the scene. And it basically, if you follow the Environment Art Mastery tutorial, it's the, it's a combination of the blend and the overlay shaders all in one. So instead of having those different shaders, I have just one. So I can have a blend, two layers, uh, overlays, and a height blend. So here's how it looks like in practice. So let me just collapse all the layers. Uh, let me choose one with the blend setup, I think. Yeah, this one here has the blend setup. So the, the options the material has is, um, so layer one is always exposed, right? And it's the, the roughness, the ORM map, normal map, all that stuff. And then I can enable a layer two. So I can enable or disable. So look how cool this works instantly. And the second layer has a few options. The roughness I can change to. So you see very few options, right? And uh, here I can set a blend mask, uh, like how blurry the mask is, it can go both ways. Uh, I can invert the mask. So uh, sometimes the order of the layers is not correct, you know, like when you have a brick and a plaster. So this basically just flips the mask. And this one inverts the, the, the gradient. So inverts the order that the things are uh, displayed and then we got the overlay which is just uh, using the second UV channel and then I, I can enable the overlay like for all layers or for just one layer and then I got UV scaling options that allow me to scale the texture as I scale the object so you see like how this is not getting stretched but looks like this is not the right direction it's, it's mostly used for stuff like this, like modular pieces that I can scale. Uh, let me enable this one. So we can enable wall. So now when I scale, that UVs get scaled as well. See, the texture doesn't get stretched. So this is, I only use this for modular pieces. And the other thing I had to do was to create the, re-export the assets and create clean prefabs. So here's how it looks like. So this is the prefab and the prefab already has all the settings that I need. So for example, I want this to cast shadows and use the light probes, but the decal, see the decal here? This one, I don't want to cast shadows and, and receive and, and affect the probes. So I, ha I had to create this by hand. But the, the hard part, which I think will be the asset placement, the script handled that for me. I, I hope this makes it clear, you know, exactly what I did. And uh, next, I'm going to uh, show the process. Like I recorded some videos as I was exporting so you can see the, the progression. And uh, this is not meant to be a tutorial. It's mostly the walkthrough of like how I converted this project. And uh, hopefully you can learn a thing or two on this and uh, if you if you want to see more uh, Unity videos or for example if you're an Unreal uh, user and you would like to see a video about like oh what how to m make a quick environment in Unity you know like 
set up the lighting, like all this basic stuff. Let me know in the comments because if there's a lot of uh, requests and then I'll, I'll, I'll put some time into that. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. Okay, so let's get started with the conversion. So here is when I started. I created a new Unreal project. I copied my files there. And if you look here, I renamed my content folder to converted. And the reason that I did this is because I wanted these files to be set in a separate folder in Unity because the one called Spanish style would contain only the cleaned up, like approved assets. Because the tool that I used to convert from Unreal to Unity, it does a really great job bringing the files, but not in the most efficient way. So there was a lot of manual work that I had to do to, to make the, the conversion clean. And uh, so before I exported, I selected all the objects in the scene and uh, I cleared the vertex colors. And uh, I did that by going to mesh paint and then uh, clear or remove. And I did this because I noticed that if I converted the objects with the painted vertex colors, they would become a separate prefab in Unity. And uh, I wanted these files to be as close to the Unreal structure as possible, right? So I didn't want to have building O2 slash O2, O3, O, you know, like for the same building. So by removing all the vertex colors, this will make sure that they, if the buildings have the exact same data, they will use the same prefab in the converted project. So here um, I'm setting the, the settings to send to Unity. And uh, <laughs> I think here I made a big mistake because tangent to world location, uh, I think I should have tried a different setting there because once in Unity, I had to rotate these objects 90 degrees because the, the axes are different. Like what's Y and what's Z in Unity and Unreal is, is different. So yeah, maybe I should have ex experimented a bit more there because it added a lot of manual time after. So here the tool is exporting and converting everything over to the new project in Unity. And also in Unity, I'm gonna have these files in a separate project. It's not gonna be my main project. I wanna make sure that the files are clean, you know, before I bring into the main project because I, I want that main project to be very clean. So there was only one error message here, but it's not important because I'm not really using that material. So here what the tool did, it created a Unity project with all the references that it could find in the map. So the tool only converts one map at a time. And in my case, it's okay because I, the other maps that I have, they were not very developed. I could make them from scratch. So if, if you have several levels, this will make it harder. So you see here, Unity Projects, Unity uh, Spanish Town Receiving. So this was a project that I created as my burner project, let's say. And uh, I would bring my files here, make sure that everything works good, and then bring to my real project. So here's what the project looked like, uh, straight out of the tool. And don't expect much. But it's actually pretty impressive how, at first glance, m the basics are there. You know, the base is there. But as they say, the devil is always in the details, right? And uh, I will show you some of these devils that I had to conquer during this conversion. So here's what I was saying. So you look, so this is the prefabs folder. So if you never use it, uh, Unity before, Unity has this really cool concept of prefabs, which is a reusable object. All you have to do to create a prefab is just drag and drop from the hierarchy to the project they will create a prefab that, that you can place in other places and you can make changes to one and propagate to the others. So because some of the buildings in Unreal, they had a material overrides, right? Like let's say so they were using the same uh, building, but then some of them were using the white plaster and the other one using the yellow plaster. Or if one had vertex paint and the other didn't, this tool created a separate prefabs for that. So you can see here like O2, 1, 2, 3. But I don't wanna have those extra prefabs, I wanna have just one. So that's one of the things that I'm gonna have to clean up. Uh, uh, and this was a very manual process. 
took three weeks to do the entire conversion. But out of the box, you know, like it's not bad at all, right? It's much more than expected. And then just for fun, I, I threw a quick lighting scenario. So not bad at all, right? To as a start, like the tool did maybe, well, the tool did a ton of work because I didn't have to rebuild the level, the placement of the objects, which is, this would be the most time consuming part for sure. Like imagine having to rebuild this, like no way. The tool took care of maybe like 40% of the conversion and the other 60% I had to do by hand to make sure that everything worked as performant as possible and that I had full control over this and that I had a clean pipeline to, in case I want to update the files. For example, I, I later I found out there is a bug on this building, you know, like the texture is stretched and I need to update it. So I wanted to set that up so I can just do that with one click. Click. So that also took some time. Uh, but yeah, here is the humble beginnings of this uh, conversion. Okay, so here I'm demonstrating one of the pain points that I had, which was, I think, related to that setting that I was talking about before with the axis. So here is the converted uh, prefab. And then I made a clean prefab on my own. Like I, I re-exported the mesh from uh, Maya to Unity and I created a clean prefab because I really wanted to understand how to create these prefabs. And uh, I, I, I didn't trust that the tool would create like a perfect, like super clear prefab. So one of the problems that I faced is this. When I replace the converted prefab with the clean prefab, they are not facing the same direction. And I tried all kinds of settings here to see if I could fix that. Uh, and nothing worked. So in the end, I just had to <laughs> rotate every object uh, when I replaced them with a, with a clean prefab. And this wasn't so bad because you can select several objects at the same time and rotate them. Is that, that's not so bad. Uh, but depending on the kind of project we're making, for example, if it's a very, it's a heavily modular environment, that might be really annoying. Another annoyance that I faced is if I was using negative scaling in Unreal because uh, some of, yeah, some of these axes were different in Unity. So they would be imported with the minus one and uh, that also added to the confusion here. So here's what I had to do to make that object match is also do a minus one here. But I think in Unreal I was doing minus X or minus Y, I don't remember. So this had to be compensated. So yeah, the objects that had a uh, negative skills also required some extra attention. So here is another example of me replacing the converted prefab with a clean one. And here I was trying to understand like exactly what was happening. Like it, it took it took a while for you know <laughs> for me to wrap my head around like why this was happening. And uh, that's the kind of things that you you learn when you when you do something like this. Like you jump into the unknown, right? And during the way, you're gonna find, you're gonna encounter obstacles or things that are beyond your present understanding, your present knowledge. So then that causes you to do some research. And then from that, you learn very unexpected things. And this project was like this, like from the beginning, I learned so many things that I didn't even know that I, I wanted to learn, you know, in terms of how things are rendered, What's the best way to go about the modeling pipeline uh, with Unity, which I think in the Rio is easier, you know, to just export a mesh and, you know, get that mesh in the map. In Unity, you, you, you need a few extra steps uh, to save some headaches. So I had to figure it out all these things during this time. It's not like I knew exactly, oh, I know what I'm doing. I kind of just had a direction. I was, I was like, okay, I, I'm going to take one week and uh, I'm gonna do whatever needs to be done to convert this. And it ended up taking three weeks instead. But it's just how things are. The importance is to have a plan and go in a clear uh, direction. Okay, so one of the things that I had to do differently is uh, how I organized my uh, Maya files. When you import a FBX file into Unreal, you have the option to combine the meshes. So for example, the way I had this before was the arches were uh, separated like this. 
you know, the trims where you're in another object here. So in Unreal, when you import this, it collapses all of those into one object. But Unity doesn't have this option. You have to, whatever you have here will become a separate mesh in the engine. So I, I took the, the opportunity to go back and clean up all my uh, Maya files and make sure that the, the naming was correct. So here, here's an example of that. So I'm basically just taking the name and I'm adding the prefix SM for static mesh because if you have the same name and you try to export, the FBX exporter is not gonna work. If the locator or group has the same name as the object that is to be exported, it's, it's not gonna export and it's not gonna give an error message. So here I'm just making sure that everything is merged, that every file has the correct uh, nomenclature. And this is something that I should have done before, but it's annoying, <laughs> right? Sometimes you just wanna make art and uh, you, you kinda skip these kind of things. But when you're going to work long term on a project, this becomes extremely important. Like I need to have a way to open any file in the project later on and just hit one button and it's going to export and it's going to work in game. So that's why the prefab had to be clean. Uh, that's why the naming had to be perfect. Because imagine like a year from now, I have to fix a bug in these buildings. And then, oh, this file, the names are different. You know, the, the format is different or this exports to like a folder that doesn't follow like a pattern, that becomes a nightmare in the future. So here is when I was trying to figure out how to create these uh, prefabs. What you see here on the left is the object imported from uh, Maya or Blender. Like if you exported an FBX, it would show up like this. And this is, it, it gets a little confusing on Unity. Because you can, you can drag and drop this prefab into the map and the model is going to show up there. But what's going to happen is, if you want to later on, if you update that model, it breaks some of the references there. Like you, you run into problems. So the clean way to do it is to have, is to encapsulate that mesh into a prefab. So if you export the mesh, create a new object and you put that mesh inside and then you place the prefab, the object. So then later on, if you, if, even if you wanna delete this mesh or add another one and stuff, it doesn't matter because you have the prefab. You can add uh, effects, you can add settings. Let's say like d later on in the project, there is a need to put uh, breakable meshes, you know, like every time there is a window or the programmers come up with a system for collision detection and you need to change some setting, you know? If you have a prefab, you can do all that in the prefab, not if you only have the mesh. So let me show this difference real quick because this is very important coming from Unreal. Like this will bite you in the ass if you, if you don't pay attention to this. And you can tell the difference is uh, the prefab has this icon with the diagonals and the imported mesh has this icon here. So when you see this mesh, you should never do it. Never do like this. Like it will work, right? It works here, but you should do this, the prefab. And the prefab, as I said, is just an empty object with the meshes inside. So then later, if I change this, if I re-export this mesh, it's gonna work fine. So yeah, if I place this guy here and now I can go there to the prefab and I can change it. For example, if I, I, I want to add an effect, so I'm just going to add a cube here or like a sound or whatever, you know, I put a cube and I saved and now that's going to propagate to all the instances of that object. Yeah. And then later, if I want to add a light you know it's all good it's gonna propagate like that very easy to do that and will save you a lot of headaches so then i created this uh, separate mat as a as a playground you know to make sure that the assets had the correct lighting setting so here is where i was i was really learning about uh the probe probe lights 
learning more about Unity, this part of the pipeline was something that always mystified me a little bit in Unity. I always knew there was a better way to do things how compared to what I was doing before, but uh, I had to take this time to figure this out. So it pays off to have these little scenes where you can test uh, lighting techniques or, you know, like to make effects. Al always have like a throwaway scene somewhere where you can try new stuff. So here I'm just continuing uh, this work of applying the prefabs and, you know, like cleaning up, re-exporting the buildings. So I, I went back to Maya, cleaned up the files, I re-exported them to the new folder. Remember I said before that I had a Spanish Town converted folder, that's why. If, I, if something was in the converted folder, I knew that it was dirty and there should be a clean version of it. So I made sure that every time I made a clean version, I deleted the dirty version. And uh, this took quite some time to export all the meshes again. Basically what I was using from the conversion tool is just the placement of the objects. But the actual assets, I re-exported them. The textures, the shaders I had to recreate, so I had to do all the work by hand. The work that I didn't have to do was the rebu rebuilding of the map, the placement of the objects. So here's some uh, funny problems, you know, like I was still trying to figure out the direction of the, the axes and trying to change that in Maya, re-exporting, and in the end I just accepted that I would have to rotate them. And uh, yeah, I had to do this for every object, which was pretty zen to be honest. Like I would do this at, later in the day when I was tired because it's a very mindless task. I wouldn't do this in the morning when my mind is still fresh. And uh, so here at this point, I colored all the dirty prefabs with the red uh, tint. And I did this so I could see very clearly like what was clean and what was supposed to be replaced. So here's more cleanup work in the ground file. So you can see that it was very disorganized. I had to clean up and remove stuff that shouldn't be there. So here's an example of um, me replacing like an old prefab with a new one with the different axis. So I would drag and drop the new prefab, replace, and then I had to hold shift and then just rotate 90 degrees. And I tried to automate this to create a script to do this, but it didn't work very well because there were some edge cases. Like sometimes if the mesh was uh, flipped in a reel with the negative scaling and then you would have to turn the other direction. So I just accepted that I had to do by hand. So at this point, my main objective was to get the entire map at this level, you know, like of like just flat shaded, but with the clean prefabs. I just went very methodical about this. So for example, the first week, I figured out how to do the conversion. The second week, it was about finishing all the architecture. And then the last week was about converting the props, the last details, the, the extra shaders, like the foliage shader. I didn't make the trees. I got them from the marketplace, from Nastya Ermakova. Uh, amazing trees, and I wanted to reuse them in Unity. So I had to create a new foliage shader. But actually, that was a good thing because the, then I had to learn about vegetation uh, shading, which was something that I knew very little before. So I learned how to do wind shader effect, uh, how to do the subsurface scattering and uh, like all that stuff. So that's how I approach this, like from in steps, you know, like really trying to get the, the most basic work done first and then the more specialized work after. Okay, so here's an interesting uh, tidbit. So uh, this is what I was talking about the, that I, when I tried to do this uh, script to rotate the pieces automatically. And I even thought about, oh, what if I use a chat a GPT to generate the code, you know? So because I'm not very familiar with the editor window uh, scripting in, in Unity, uh, you see like you have to derive from the editor Unity. So to save some time, I was like, oh, what if, can I go to chat GPT and generate a script that gets me to like 90% of the work and then I just add the extra functionalities that I needed. And uh, so yeah, I, I asked the GPT to create a code and I'm just gonna copy paste. And um, so this was, I was trying to automate this rotation, right? And um, so to make a long story short, like it generated a script, but it, it didn't do what I was looking for. I don't think that, ChatGPT is very smart when it comes to scripting, like it can generate some stuff, 
but it's very literal, you know, like it doesn't understand the problem. It doesn't know programming. It, it just regurgitates all this stuff and uh, generates something that kind of works. So I, I, I experimented this for a few minutes, but then I, I gave up. I was just like, oh, you know, I'm just going to make it by hand. It's one of those things that if you try to be too smart, uh, you know, you're just going to create something that's overkill for what you need. Yeah, so more conversions here. Uh, here I, I finished all the prefabs in the architecture. So I started to replace all the buildings with the new prefabs and making sure that they face the right direction. And this wasn't very hard because I, I don't have a lot of different assets in this map. I was very economical. I only have about six or seven uh, different buildings. So it was very quick to just go all over the map and, and replace the old dirty prefabs with the new clean ones. Okay, so this is after I converted the buildings and the ground and uh, I started to experiment with the lighting. And my first reaction was to use light maps, right? Because uh, the probe uh, volumes, the adaptive probe volumes at this moment, there is still an experimental feature. So I was like, mm, you know, like I felt, uh, I was feeling like a little hesitant, you know, of using something that is not like considered final yet. But as you can see, with the light maps, I was getting this huge, this really horrible seams, and, and it, it just took too long to bake. So that's what I was looking for. So this was um, a map baked with the light probes. So uh, I made this small um, environment that I could experiment with the technology and, and find the good values. You see how still there's uh, some blobs in there that uh, this was I was able to fix after. This uh, I took some time to really learn how the light probes work, uh, what kind of settings are good or not. And here I'm showing like one of the cool features, which is having different light scenarios. Here I had to do by hand in order to change the, the, the light and stuff, but that can be automated with code. And uh, with the light probes, you can have different lighting scenarios. And uh, this is very powerful. Like uh, I'm very excited about this feature. So here I was showing and uh, just go back, just so you can see here, I have two scenarios, afternoon and day, and then here I'm just disabling the sun for the afternoon or for the day and enabling the one for the afternoon. That's the part that, I, that I'm saying that can be automated. So here's a recording like a few days uh, later and uh, I'm showing the, the manual work that I had to do, like for example, the decals, uh, because they had a different scales. I, I just did them by hand, each one. And also you see sometimes they were not placed perfectly and they were clipping to the geometry. So I took the opportunity to fix this. But yeah, this was a very time consuming task. Look how many I have. All the red ones here. Okay, so this video is, is many days later. So here I already re-exported most of the textures. I recreated the materials. I had to create new shaders that replicated uh, the functionality that I had in Unreal with the vertex blending, like all that stuff. But you can see that it was already starting to look uh, good here. And again, this is all baked with the light probes. And uh, here I was showing a bug actually that I had with the, with the lens flare effect that I got from the marketplace. And when you have the DLSS enabled, so this is an upscaler for NVIDIA cards. You can run the game at 1080p, but it's gonna render in 4K. Like it does some calculations to upscale the image and make it look sharp. And this was breaking, the effect was breaking the DLSS. So, <laughs> I, I hate to take such a big jump, but uh, I got carried over like during this phase and I was just converting the stuff and I really forgot to record my screen. The next, so the next days I was just recreating the assets, you know, I was, it was the same process that I showed now. I would have to create a new material, figure out how to do the foliage shader, create clean assets, re-export objects. Uh, the trees and the props, actually, I didn't re-export them. I just used the, convers the converted version uh, because those objects were bought, they're purchased. So I don't have the Maya file for those. So it was a, a lot of work like that, you know, like just recreating the assets. But 
for me, I think it was totally worth it. So here I found a picture of the foliage before I created the foliage shader. So look at the difference, you know, like it was all messed up and with this shader, it just looks so beautiful. I was, I was really surprised, like how the subsurface scattering and a proper shader uh, makes stuff look, look good. So look at the difference, it's all messed up, but with the right shader, it, it looks, you know, like how you intended. Here's another in-between uh, screenshot too. You see this was before I had this material created. This object didn't have the proper shader. The, so, you know, like the, I used, it, I, I used a special technique there to have the painting in the middle. Yeah, the objects didn't have the vertex painting, which was another thing that I had to do, uh, to do, to do the material uh, blending. And I explored some options to, to do this in Unity, you know, to simulate this behavior in, in Unreal, like how if you're not using an eye, you can have per object vertex painting. And uh, in Unity, this didn't work very well because all the solutions that I found for this, they would create a separate mesh with the vertex color. So that meant that if I updated the mesh later, that one would be a different prefab. So I, I wanted to avoid that. So I actually went back to Maya and I painted the vertex colors in Maya. So every object has the same uh, vertex colors. But one advantage is that it could be much more precise with paint with uh, painting these uh, transitions. So here you can see when I update, like I traded the benefit for doing this in the map for the flexibility of having just one mesh. And then later, if I need to update that mesh, I can just make sure the vertex colors are correct. And then every instance will be correct. Well, so that's all that I have uh, for this video. Uh, there is actually a lot more to this than I was able to show, but I wanted this video to be compact. If I was showing every single thing I had to do here, this video would be hours long. I hope it gave you an idea of the amount of work uh, that it took to do this. And if you're looking to convert your project to Unity as well, like the kind of problems that you might face and some of the solutions I found, but every project is different. For example, if you have terrain, that's gonna be like a different problem to solve that I didn't have to because I, I, don't, I, I don't use the terrain system from U Unity or Unreal. I only use the st static meshes. So in my case, I don't think it was very hard because I wasn't doing anything very specific in Unreal that Unity can't do. But if you're making like a big open world uh, game with uh, lots of terrains and you know, like and a lot of stuff that was like really made in the, un in the Unreal editor, uh, I'm not sure how that's gonna convert. So just keep in mind that if you're looking to do this, you're gonna have to face quite a few unique uh, problems. And that's good because it will force you to really learn more about like uh, art pipeline, about the difference in the the differences in the engines, uh, like how files get exported, how they get imported, all that stuff is a lot of technical knowledge that is very valuable that you only acquire when you do something. And uh, performance is like this, like you only learn about performance when you do bad stuff. Like when your map is running <laughs> pretty slow and then you need to debug and figure it out and then you're like, oh, it's because I'm using too much transparency here or because my textures are all in 4K and I'm running out of memory. So that's how you learn is by doing, you know, like you, it's not just reading, or watching videos is, is both. You need both. A lot of times you have to find the solution. And uh, I hope with this video, you, you get an idea of like the kind of work that it takes to do this. Uh, and also, yeah, I hope it was interesting to watch. And if you are interested in more Unity tutorials, uh, let me know. As I said, I want to upgrade the Environment Art Mastery with a Unity chapter. So both engine users can benefit from the tutorial the same way because the workflow is very similar. And this is the proof. Like uh, the maps look a little bit different here because the lighting angle is not the same. But look, if it can be done here, it can be done here. If it can be done here, it also can be done here. So it's not a, a matter of black or white is like which tool is best for the specific problem that you're facing.
And in my case, uh, the answer was Unity. In your case, it might be Unreal. It might be Game Maker, Godot, Blender Engine, I don't know, CryEngine, right? If you're making like a huge forest with trees and stuff, like just go with CryEngine. Um, but yeah, I see you in the next video. Let me know in the comments if you enjoy this tutorial and if you have requests for future tutorials and uh, I see you next time. Hey, if you enjoyed this video and you're looking to step up your environment art skills, I invite you to check my environment art creation course, Environment Art Mastery. This is a massive course that took me more than two years to put together and contains everything that I learned about environment art creation after more than a decade in the games industry. The course contains everything you need to know to be able to come up with your own ideas and take them to completion by using an easy to follow process that breaks down the creative process in logic steps. This process can be used to create all kinds of environments, no matter the style, theme or engine. If you want to know more, visit environmentartmastery.com or watch the deep dive video in my channel. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again in the next video.